Good morning, everyone. Greetings to our audio and YouTube listeners once again. We are gathered again to pay heed to Mary's messages to the world. Like the shepherds of Bethlehem and the Magi in the East, we have to go in search of these blessings from heaven because they don't always come to us like a newspaper tossed at our door or an email advertisement that arrives at our inbox. And we cannot expect to find news in our parish bulletin. The Magi inquired at the temple in Jerusalem, and Herod called in the priest to ask about prophecies concerning the birth of the Messiah. They found the right answer in the book of Micah and sent the Magi on their way, but they themselves do not bother to make the journey to behold the Word made flesh. We will speak today about another approved apparition in France. In my opinion, it's one of the most beautiful and most precious in Mary's mosaic, but astonishingly, very few people, even among the French, know about it now. It occurred on a Tuesday evening, January 17, 1871, in the little farm village of Pontmont. In French, the name refers to a type of bridge. In English, it looks like Main Point. And I'm going to call it Pont Main rather than try to say it the French way. I think mo both meanings of bridge and Main Point are appropriate. This January night was a critical moment during the Franco-Prussian War. The Prussians were very close to this village. Nearly 30 local boys had just left to try to boost the French troops stationed nearby. But because of what happened this night, the Prussians retreated instead of advancing. So you can say that they were stopped at this bridge, and thus the nation was spared. The war ended in 10 days. As for the main point, we must first unfold the story. I'll upload to the website a 70-page PDF. This is an English translation of the official version of the story, written just a few days after the apparition by Abbe, perhaps Michel Richard. It just has M. Richard. He was the chaplain of the Sisters of Hope, whose mother house was in Laval, a town close to Pontmont, Pontmain. This booklet was published by John Haffert and the Ave Maria Press of the Blue Army, probably in the 1950s, but there is no date. It's in the public domain now. I encourage you to meditate on the story at your leisure. Today I'll give a synopsis and discuss its place in Mary's mosaic. La Salette is in southeast France. pont Main is directly opposite in northwest France. La Salette was high in the Alps, and the dialect was a mixture of Italian and Spanish in the 1800s. pont Main was a farm village in Brittany, where for many centuries the people spoke the Celtic language of their Breton founders who had escaped to France when fleeing Saxon invaders. After World War II, it was mandated that French be taught in the schools of Brittany because Breton soldiers had not been able to understand orders given in French. Father Richard wrote down the account in French, but with frequent quotes from the original dialect. More directly opposing is the religious situation of these two places of La Salette and pont -Main. In La Salette, hardly anyone went to Mass or prayed. In Brittany, on the contrary, there was a, a vibrant Catholicism. Today it remains one of the most devoutly Catholic regions in France. This is the land of Saint Anne. She had appeared in Auray, and every parish in Brittany had a fervent devotion to the Mother of, of the Mother of God. Brittany numbers more than 300 local saints. Only a few are actually canonized in the Catholic Church, but statues and stained glass are everywhere. During the Briton emigration to Brittany in the 4th and 5th centuries, several missionaries, mostly Welsh, came into the region and founded dioceses. Since the local dialect was retained there, a strong sense of connection to their roots was also kept. The modern, decadent French philosophies of Voltaire and the Freemasons had little influence on these people. I mention all this to help us move into a world so different from our own. We live in a global village. We receive news and pictures instantly from many nations besides our own. But in the 1800s, everything outside one's village was an unknown world. Can we imagine the fright they were experiencing? We are in January 1871. 
Paris was besieged by the Prussian army. Two thirds of the country were in the enemy's power. The Battle of Le Mans had laid Mayenne and Brittany open to the invaders. Brittany as yet remained intact, but the eruption of the invaders into the neighboring town of Mayenne made the movement westward appear imminent. France was about to be swept by German soldiers from the Rhine to the ocean. But heaven was listening to prayers, and this is the main point of pont -Main. One never sees work on Sunday in pont -Main in those days. It is indeed rare, they said, ever to hear the Lord's name in vain. Children raised in the fear of God respect and obey their parents. That Tuesday morning, the two brothers, Eugene, age 12, and Joseph, age 10, prayed a rosary for their elder soldier brother, Auguste, and then they did their chores. Afterwards, they went to Mass, but before Mass, they prayed the morning offering and the way of the cross, their daily routine. After Mass, they joined in public prayers for the soldiers, and then they went to school. Three sisters, sister adorers of the justice of God, instructed the boys and girls. After school, in the early evening, already it was quite dark at 5.30 because it was winter, they went to the barn to do more chores. Eugène peeked outside the door to see the snow and the stars. Suddenly, at about 20 feet above the center of the roof, he saw a tall, beautiful lady. Her robe, seeded with golden stars, fell from the neck to her feet without belt or cincture. The sleeves were wide and flowing. She was wearing slippers, which were as blue as the dress, and at the center of each slipper was a golden ribbon, which formed a knot like rosette. Her hair and ears were completely hidden by a black veil, which also covered about a third of her forehead. She had her hands spread out and lowered as one normally represents Mary Immaculate. Eugene feared she had come to announce the death of his brother, but she smiled at him, and he felt calm. Eugene asked his father and little brother if they could see anything in the sky. Joseph, who was age nine, we said, cried out, no, he was ten, cried out a description of the lady. They called their mother, but the parents could see nothing. The mother suggested that they pray five potters and five aves in honor of the Blessed Virgin. After a while, Joseph was clapping his hands and exclaiming, and this caught the curiosity of the nearby neighbors. Someone called one of the school sisters. She was in her classroom, praying the divine office. Since none of the adults could see anything, and the boys seemed so sincere, sister went to call some children. She found Francois Richet, 11 years old, and Jean-Marie Le Boss, 9 years old. The latter was afraid of the dark and wasn't sure she wanted to go outside. But when the children looked up in the sky, they immediately began crying out, Oh, beautiful lady! The wife of Botuan, the bootmaker, drawn in by the noise, ran up with her little daughter, two years old and one month, wrapped in her arms. The little child also cast her eyes at once toward the apparitions and waving her innocent hands, cried out several times the words taught to her by her mother, the Jesus, the Jesus. Her mother tried in vain to distract her by showing her other objects, but always the eyes and the arms of the baby turned, toward, turned back to the apparition. The pastor is called to the scene, a holy priest who had labored 35 years for the 500 members of his pious flock. If only the children see, he said, it is because they are more worthy than we. But Father, said Sister Mary Edward, what if you would speak to the Blessed Virgin? Alas, said the old, good, good old man, his voice deeply moved and with profound humility. I do not see her. What would I say to her? Let us pray. Everybody knelt down, some in the barn, others at the entrance. Sister Mary Edward began the rosary to which everyone answered. During this prayer, the lady seemed to go upwards and increase in size in a manner clearly perceived by the children. As the rosary continued, the stars of the atmosphere began to arrange themselves into rows beneath the lady, coming two by two beneath her feet, while the stars on her dress multiplied. The children said, it's like a hill becoming covered with ants. Soon she will be nearly all golden with these stars. 
After the rosary the Magnificat was intoned, and letters began to form in the sky. The children were deliberately separated, but they all saw the same thing as the vision continued. Just then a townswoman arrived to tell them, a townsman arrived to tell them to pray because the Prussians were on their way to Laval. This should have caused great fear, but instead the man was pulled into the circle and he too experienced the joy of the apparition. The beautiful lady smiled constantly, but pray, my children. It was about 7.30. This, I didn't make clear, was on the, the letters that were forming in the sky. So the first was, but pray, my children. We must sing the litanies of the Blessed Virgin, said the venerable pastor, and pray that she manifests her will. Sister Mary Edward began the litanies. At the first invocation, the children publicly cried out, look, again, something is happening. They are letters. It is a D. And they named one after another the letters of the following words, which were completely written by the end of the litanies. It said, God will hear you in a short time. Look, they said, she smiles. And laughing themselves with joy, they repeated again, look, she laughs. Next, they sang the hymn, In Violata. Immediately, the children announced that new letters were forming on the white writing space, but on a second line. At the moment, they finished singing, O Mater Alma Christi Carissima, which goes, O Sweet and Beloved Mother of Christ, the children spelled out, letter by letter, these words that began, My Son. An indescribable emotion seized the crowd. It is indeed the Blessed Virgin, said the children. It is she, repeated the crowd. Next, they sing hymns to Mary, and before the end of the Salve Regina, the text had formed, My son permits himself to be moved. Sister Mary Edward intoned the song, Mother of Hope, of name so sweet, protect our country, pray for us, pray for us. During this singing, the Blessed Virgin lifted her hands to the height of her shoulders, hands which formerly had been lowered and spread out, and moved her fingers lightly, as if she were accompanying the singing of the hymn with a stringed instrument. She kept looking at the children with a smile of infinite sweetness. Look, she's laughing! And they jumped joyously, clapping their hands, repeating a hundred times, Oh, how beautiful she is! Oh, how beautiful she is! The crowd laughed and cried at the same time, in transports of joy. Then they sang, May my sweet Jesus, Finally, now is the time to forgive our penitent hearts. We will no longer offend your supreme goodness, O oh, sweet Jesus. Suddenly, the faces of the children took on an expression of deep sadness. Look, they said, she becomes sad. All the children at the same time saw a red cross about 60 centimeters high, bearing a Christ of the same color. The cross seemed to, have, seemed to them to be about a foot in, in front of the beautiful lady. And at once, lowering her hands, she took the crucifix and held it with her two hands, slightly inclined towards the children, as though presenting it to them. At the top of the cross, on a white background, were written in red letters, Jesus Christ. Then they sang, Parche Domine. Forgive me, Lord, forgive your people. Do not be angry with us forever. The Most Holy Virgin, sad and recollected, seemed to pray with the crowd. Suddenly, a star left from beneath her feet and riding towards the left, went through the blue circle and lit the candle, which was at the height of her knees and up to the second at shoulder height. The same star crossing over the head of the Virgin passed to the right side and lit the other two candles. Then it climbed back up again, crossed the, through the sky, and took a position above the head of the lady, remaining suspended there. The silent and recollected crowd prayed constantly. Sister Mary Edward intoned the hymn, Ave Maristella. As she did so, the red crucifix disappeared. The lady, extending her arms, again took the pose of the Immaculate Conception. On each of her shoulders appeared a little white cross. These crosses, said the children, were planted on the shoulders of the Blessed Virgin. The woman, of, the mother of God, smiled again at the children, who cried again in fullness of joy. Look, she is smiling. 
Look, she is smiling. It was now about 8.30 p.m. My dear friends, said the pastor, we are going to say together our evening prayer. Everybody knelt down. During the examination of conscience, the children announced that a great white veil was beginning from beneath her feet to slowly rise up and cover her to the waist. Then it rose little by little until it enveloped her to the throat. The children now saw only the face of a completely celestial beauty, of the lady who continued to smile upon them. Soon her face, too, became veiled. Only the crown remained visible with the stars about it. Finally, everything disappeared, including the great blue circle. The four candles remained burning around to the end. The pastor called the children. Do you still see, he asked, and all together, no, Father, all has disappeared. It is over. It was a quarter to nine. The crowd left little by little, preoccupied by happening so extraordinary and which had brought to them an impression full of sweetness, profound and unforgettable. There was a great miracle that night. Let's tell the story. Before this evening of January 17th, the Prussians wished absolutely to march upon Laval. It has been proved beyond doubt that the German com commander-in-chief spoke the following words to the Bishop of Le Mans precisely on the evening of the 17th. This evening, my troops are in Laval. Official records of the high command, of the German high command, state that something happened that night. The advance upon Laval of the 20th Division was not carried out because on the night of January 17th to 18th, the Supreme Commander made it known that it was not planned to proceed further towards the West with the Second Army, end quote. Then on the date of the 18th, we read, the pursuit of the adversary, that is to say the French, by the detachment of General Smith, Schmidt thus came to an end because of these proscriptions. So following the orders of the commanding general, the 10th Corps, General Schmidt had to draw back on January 18th upon Vege and its surroundings. As a result, after having reassembled his detachment on the main road, General Schmidt returned to Vege and established his troops there. Quote, Ver is said somewhere, General Schmidt regretted very much that he was not allowed to take Laval, which would have given him possession of the Mayenne line. So during the very night which followed the apparition, a formal and unexpected expected order prevented General Schmidt from taking Laval. The Prussian troops were at the Pool of Barb, only a mile from Laval, and the next day they were, they were at Vege, 12 miles back from Laval. Humanly speaking, this fact is inexplicable. No fort defends Laval. Divinely speaking, it is explicable. What happened? So sure did the German general feel of success that he had already fixed the sum to be levied on the conquered town at three million francs. Laval, the capital of the Mayenne, at this juncture was not altogether without defense. The remnant of the army of Le Mans, under General Shanzi, was within it, preparing to repel an attack, although his soldiers were weakened and discouraged by defeat and privation. Moreover, the town was unprotected by forts. In short, the taking of Laval by the enemy seemed certain. The Prussian general is reported to have said on the morning of the 18th, we cannot go farther. Yonder, in the direction of Brittany, there is an invisible Madonna barring our way. So their sudden retreat meant, together with the saving of Brittany, the turning back of the tide of conquering soldiery from that part of France. The war was virtually over. Twelve days later, the armistice was signed at Versailles. So on the evening before, January 17th, the Blessed Virgin had smiled upon France from the heaven of Pontmain, promising that God would hear their prayers in a short time, and short it was. But it wasn't only the prayers of the parish at Pontmain going on. A St. Brule in Brittany, not far from Pontmain, was the well-known chapel of Notre Dame de Sprance, Our Lady of Hope the seat of the arch confraternity founded under that name. Devotion to Mary under that title was already popular in the area, and this is why eventually the official title of Our Lady at Pontmain became Our Lady of Hope. 
A national vow to which France attributes its preservation was made in the old sanctuary of Aubignier on the 20th of January, evidently a year before, by the bishop, surrounded by a large number of the clergy and an immense crowd of the faithful. Unfortunately, I couldn't find details on all this, but let it be known that the people in that area of Brittany were praying. News of this marvelous apparition spread like lightning. Although only about 60 some persons were present that cold night, in all the parish of some 500 persons, not one was incredulous. We believe the children, they said. Pilgrims start arriving from all directions. The Diocese of Laval, so profoundly religious, considers itself fortunate in the thought that the Blessed Virgin chose it for this manifestation of her maternal goodness. Now we have to know at this point, we've already had the Miraculous Medal, then La Salette, and then Lourdes, which I'll, get, I'll talk to a little at the end of this thing. And so there was already an idea that apparitions do happen. So it wasn't a new thing like it was earlier. So already they were thinking, you know, this, this is a true apparition. The bishop began an investigation immediately, and one year later, formal approval was given, February 2nd, 1872. Bishop Casimir Alexis Joseph Weichart, Bishop of Lefal, declared, We judge that the Immaculate Mary, Mother of God, has truly appeared on January 17, 1871, to Eugene Barbedet, Joseph Barbedet, François Richer and Jean-Marie Le Boss in the hamlet of Pontmore. In the same document, Bishop Weichart, Bishop of Laval, recognized four official seers, but he did not ask them to testify formally because they were minors and nothing would be recognized in court. In 1900, the new church was consecrated. In 1905, Pope Pius X elevated the sanctuary to the status of, of a basilica. And in France, at least locally, the Feast of Our Lady of Pontmont is celebrated on the anniversary date, January 17th. Um, just a few comments on this wonderful apparition. It begins, the very first word is but, but, but pray, my children. Several days after this apparition, the sisters of Pontmain took the children to Fougier to the mother house of their congregation. And the superior questioned the little children, she said to them, the Blessed Virgin knows grammar. She could not have begun a sentence with the word but. The little Jean-Marie, nine years old, quickly answered, well, Sister Vidaline also knows grammar. Well, then when she has had enough of seeing that we did not do our homework, she gives a good kick on the step and says, but study then. So they were saying it's, it was um, an expression already locally understood of intensity. Yes, you're praying, but pray harder, study harder, do it more. Eugene Barbadette was born November 4th, 1858, the year of Lourdes. He was the first to see the beautiful lady, and he became a priest. In 1883, he was ordained, and he would serve in the Diocese of Laval. He is remembered as a priest who was right, righteous, zealous, fervent, and uncompromising. He died a holy death May 2nd, 18, 1927. Joseph Barbadet, his brother, was born two years later in 1860. He wants to become a missionary. He entered the missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate, or being ordained priest in 1884. It doesn't say where he served. If he was a missionary, he was probably sent abroad to the different countries because the Oblates were everywhere um, in French Africa and uh, different islands, so I don't really know. At the request of his superiors, he wrote a very complete account of the apparition, and he died November 3, 1930, and he was buried there at the Apparition Cemetery at Pontmain. Francois Richer was born in 1861. She remained a profoundly Christian soul, just doing her job every day to please the good God and good virgin, as she said. She earned her living as a domestic servant and then as a teacher in several small country schools. She never married. Around 1900, she became the housekeeper of Father Barbadette, Father Eugene, the seer. She died March 28, 1915, much earlier than the rest of them. Jean-Marie Le Boss was born September 12, 1861, at Gosne. Orphaned of father and having her mother paralyzed, she is brought by her aunt, or she is, she is brought by her aunt, who was a nun, Sister Timothy, 
director of the School of Pont Maine. In 1881, she entered the Sisters of the Holy Family at Bordeaux, not that particular congregation. So it seems like it wasn't really clear, but it seems like her mother was was sick or sickly or paralyzed, and so she was overseen by her aunt, who was the director of that local school at Pont Maine. So that aunt was her mother's sister. So she was kept close to her mother and yet was walked over by the sisters. And then long after the apparition, well not that long, it was in 1871, so 10 years after the apparition, and she was only nine during the apparition, so she was about 19, she enters the Sisters of the Holy Family, which isn't the local congregation, their adores, sister adores, and so she goes to Bordeaux. 50 years after the apparition, she could no longer remember it, and she began to be afflicted with a scrupulous conscience. She felt she had to make a formal ret retraction and say that she hadn't seen it 50 years ago. She did this very formally before witnesses, but it was not made public for another 40 years until 1971. <clears throat> they felt it was served no purpose because it was officially um, approved years and years ago with tons of witnesses, and, and she was a small child giving her, thing, giving her testimony. So they didn't feel like 50 years later that, that this darkness she was going to really was that, you know, was enough to say the apparition never happened. And she never, um, she never contested it with the other seers or anything like that. Um, but after she retracted that, two years later, she herself became paralyzed. And then she suffered for 10 years with some kind of paralysis. Then, from March 1933 to her death six months later, December 12th, she was reduced to absolute impotence. She couldn't move at all. She is buried in the central cemetery of Bordeaux in the section of her religious community. Did she suffer that darkness and disability as a victim soul? I think we'll only find out in the next life. So this beautiful apparition was a prelude to an era of peace and no war happened in France for another 40 years. So this was a marvel because France had been suffering one, one invasion after another, one revolt after another, revolutions, it was just so much turmoil. But now there was 40 years of peace. <clears throat> the Catholics in the country began to build themselves up better and soon would become the great Saint Therese who would be so influential in bringing the faith to the whole world again. It was the sweetest, happiest apparition in all the mosaic that we'll be looking at. There's just nothing to compare with the, the joy of this one. Mary has no reproaches. The only thing she asks is that they keep praying. She's, she's singing with them. She's, she's moving her hands like she's playing an instrument. She's almost dancing up there. The children are laughing. They're, the, all the people are there to feel that experience with them. They can't see the apparition, but they feel the emotion of it. They're all comforted. And all these people are praying devout Catholics. And none of them mock the children. As so many apparitions, the children or the seers just go through so many humiliations and they're interrogated and they're, they're treated so badly. But no one did that to these children. No one disbelieved them. And um, the three seers themselves became priests or religious and one seer remained chaste and became a priest housekeeper. Um, it was just an idyllic situation of faith and love. Now, I found one website that was rather interesting and. It was a little over the edge. I won't even give the website, but, but there were a couple points that it made. It noted that the, the vision lasted three and a half hours. Now, three and a half is a number that comes up a lot in the book of the Apocalypse, and other Marian apparitions are going to speak explicitly of the Apocalypse. So this was an interesting note, three and a half hours apparition. And then it says this very first word, may, but, it may in French, or I guess maybe the letters were in French, the children we're speaking their local dialect, but it seems like the words were in French. So this first word, but, but pray my children, this first word hung in the air for 10 minutes, leaving them kind of in suspense. And this website did a, a word check, and in French, if you give a letter, a number letter to every letter, so the A is one, B is two, etc., that word may adds up to 42. And that's another apocalyptic sign because 42 is mentioned, 42 months in the apocalypse, and 42 months is three and a half years. And so in this apparition, there are also periods of silence and prayer. 
and it's at night. And so um, the apocalyptic time will be a night of the church, a night of faith, a, a very difficult time. And it occurs in the sky. They're all looking up to the woman in the sky, which is the colors in Revelation 12. The lady appears in the sky. And in this apparition, unlike some others, she's wearing a black veil. So even though she's, she's happy with the children, she understands that they're all sad because of the war. And, uh, they, there's, so there's a hint there of Our Lady of Sorrows. And then the crown is the last thing to be seen. And this crown is another thing that appears in the apocalypse. It comes up as a symbol. And here it seems to be Mary is crowned by the prayers of the devout. Um, again, this word pont main means bridge. It actually means some kind of hand bridge, like a small bridge or, or a local bridge. I'm not really sure. Mary is a bridge to a new era. She's promising elsewhere that she will bring in the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, an era of great peace. And so get 40 years of peace after this one, but it's only afterwards in Fatima that she talks about a great era of peace that she'll bring in. Actually she talked about it in La Salette too. We didn't go there, but we, we will in time. So it's very interesting here. And unlike Lourdes or even La Salette, there were many cures at the, at the water of La Salette, the little fountain there. Physical healings at Pont Maine will be few, but conversions were very significant. A lot of people came in those early days to see what was going on, and there were many conversions of people who, who were coming farther in outside of Brittany who were not devout Catholic, and they just came for curiosity. And the priests noted that the conversions were numerous and significant. And so the priest wanted to call, it, call her title, Our Lady of Conversions.